one half small squares, maybe it's not that tough to believe that it's also going to be bounded away from 0 and 1 when you take different shapes. So in particular, we took long rectangle, doesn't say that, but probability at 1 half that they are crossed doesn't go to 1, doesn't go to 0, just remains bounded away. So, modulo, maybe we don't need the, okay. modulo the um, Rousseau's MOH, it was telling us that PC is larger or equal to one half. And this really think of it as the easy bound. So then there was the other bound, which was trying to prove that PC is smaller or equal to one half. So prove that above one half, you necessarily have an infinite connected component. And that was a little bit trickier. So what we did is that we prove a sharp threshold for these quantities. We proved that for p larger we call uh, strictly larger than one half, these things were going to one and actually going to one pretty quickly. Okay, and this I didn't explain to you Kesten's original way of proving it, which goes back to the 80s, which was by hand. I proved to you that this was true using some kind of more evolved argument, more general argument based on sharp threshold theory. So what I want to do today is start by giving you an alternative way of proving this bound, which is more suitable like to <coughs> higher dimension. And then, so it will be conditioned on a certain theorem. Then I will explain to you how you prove this theorem by hand. So kind of the Kesten way of proving this theorem. But then, tomorrow and uh, in the last uh, three lectures, Vincent will explain to you how you do the sharp special way of proving this theorem and why it's a better way, because in particular it extends to more general models. Okay? So today I'm going to do the Kesten's way somehow. But, I mean, it's not a proof due to Kesten. But. Okay, so let's go back to this PC smaller we call to one half, and let's try to prove it in a slightly different way. So what I'm going to do is imagine that I have the following results. Imagine that for any p smaller than pc, so for p smaller than pc, I know that if I denote it theta n of p, which is the probability, say, of 0 connected to the boundary of the box of size n, that's just going to be a convenient definition, I know that theta n of p goes to 0 when p is smaller than pc. Right? Because I know that 0 is connected to infinity with 0 probability. But at which speed does it go to 0? Well, I claim that when p is strictly below pc, this speed is exponential. So there exists a constant, cp, such that for every n, this is smaller than exponential of minus cp times n. So this is a theorem which is true in two dimensions, but in fact it's true, it's true in any dimension. So in, for any d larger or equal to 2, actually even in dimension 1 it would be true, so I'm going to keep it like that, there is exponential decay. It's a result which is not actually due to Kesten, it's due to Menshikov. And basically, at the same time, 
due to Eisenman and Barsky. A few years after Kesten's proof of PC equal one half. This is 80, this is 86 and 87. So really, Kesten didn't prove the thing, didn't prove PC equal one half as I'm gonna do right now. But you are gonna see once you have this theorem, it's very simple to actually prove um, PC equal one half. Why is it simple? Because if you want to prove PC smaller or equal to one half, just assume that P, PC is larger than one half. That means that one half is strictly smaller here. So there is exponentially decay at one half. Okay? Then take a box of size n times n plus one, and let's try to look at the probability. Let's try to bound from above the probability that n is connected to n plus one, uh, to uh, the left side connected to the right side, sorry. I have n points on the left. <coughs> one of them has to be connected to distance n. So this is smaller than n times theta n of one half, just by a union bound. And this guy is decaying exponentially fast. So this goes to zero. But well, that's absurd since it's equal to one half. So once you have this much stronger result, you get immediately that PC has to be smaller or equal to one half. OK? So that's a motivation for this theorem. But now you can believe me that this theorem is useful for other things than just identifying one half. It's kind of a hammer to try to, uh, to kill a, a fly in this case. This theorem is kind of harder than what I explained even yesterday. It's kind of harder than Kesten's theorem. At least morally, it is harder. So this, a priori, is not necessary to have such a strong result. But once you have it, you are home. Okay. So from now on, kind of forget Kesten's theorem, forget everything, and think, OK, this is a very interesting result to get, what we call the sharpness of the, of the phase transition. Below PC, you have exponential decay of correlations. And basically, for the rest of the lectures, we will focus on this theorem, provide you with two proof of this theorem, the Kesten kind of way, meaning the by hand, I mean, proving this by hand, and then proving this using the sharp special theory. And then we will even prove to you that this theorem holds for much more general percolation models. It doesn't have to be Bernoulli percolation. It can be, for instance, random cluster models, or Voronoi percolation, or Boolean percolation. There are a bunch of percolation type models. They all satisfy, I mean, most of them satisfy this very nice property. And really think of it as your toolbox. Once you have that, you understand the P smaller than PC phase very well. So that is the bottleneck, if you want to. OK, so today, as I said, so it's maybe the second uh, part of the lectures, is uh, um, like uh, proof of sharpness. With hands, like, uh, like uh, naive proof of uh, poor mathematician uh, proof. As, uh, I know you have this uh, uh, poor Monte Carlo simulation. It's a beautiful article on, uh, on Bernoulli percolation where people were basically doing Monte Carlo by hand at the time because they didn't, they didn't have computers. So here it's kind of like really. Okay, you don't know sharp threshold, so you try to do it really with your hands. OK. So how we, we prove that? So one observation which is important here is notice that I don't claim this is true at PC. In fact, I can even prove to you it's not true at PC, because at PC, this is equal to 1 half. Therefore, here, just doing the reverse, forgetting about that, if this is 1 half, tells me that, in fact, probability to be connected to distance n is larger than 1 over n. OK? So it doesn't decay exponentially fast. And this, actually, we want to use this fact that we are going to prove it only for P smaller than PC by trying to use differential inequalities. We are allowed to use these differential inequalities that I was mentioning before. 
And remember yesterday I mentioned this differential inequality like theta n prime larger than say a big constant times theta n one minus theta n. Ideally, what I would like to have if I want to have at pc minus delta to have exponential decay, what constant should I have here, ideally? Well, if you remember with the k here, I was getting that theta n of p minus delta was smaller than theta n of p, basically, times exponential of minus k delta. It was roughly what you would be getting. So if you want to guarantee exponential decay, this, you know, is bounded, say, by 1. So you want k to be n. Ideally, you would like that. If you would have theta n prime larger or equal to n theta n 1 minus theta n, you would be home already. You would integrate that between pc and uh, pc minus delta, and you will get exponential decay. Actually, if you think maybe just even a little bit about that, you will realize that it's not really decent to believe that you will get the differential inequality, which is that strong. You will not manage here to put n, at least not easily. So what I want to argue today is that I want to say that here I can put something big, maybe not n times theta n, but something big. So what do I know what I can put already here? So I know that I can put something like that. I mean, without anything in front of it, this is Poincaré inequality. So I didn't really prove to you this inequality. I just mentioned that it was easy to prove. Um, actually, I think Vincent told me that he's going to prove it to you tomorrow. So it's very good for me. I don't have to do it. But if you want just to be convinced that it's true, just take the BKKKL result of yesterday. K, K, K. Yes, that's good. Okay. B, K, 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 L. And just use that the inferences are smaller than constant, and you get that theta n the variance is smaller than sum of inferences, which is the derivative. So you get exactly this inequality. So this is trivial to get, but the point is that this doesn't give you anything here because you just get k equal 1, so you don't get anything. So my goal is going to be to replace here by something much larger than theta n. That's going to be my goal. I want a quantity here which is much larger than theta. In order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try first to get some information on, I mean, on, on, on the p smaller than pc phase, basically. More precisely, I want to get some information on the phase where you have exponential decay. What can I say? when I already know for sure that I have exponential decay. So let's go back in, uh, in time a little bit to one of the first papers in percolation theory due to Harris, I think. I'm always a little bit confused between Harris and Hammersley, but I think this one is due to Harris, right? Vincent, it's Harris or Hammersley for the 5 PON. I'm always confused. It's Hammersley, right? Yeah. OK. Well, it starts by Ham, then no, no, by Ha. Also in this one? Ah, OK. Yeah, so it's a quantum wedge. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Who knows? Uh, anyway. Uh, It's OK to add credit to people. So let's put it in the worst case scenario. It didn't have anything to do with it. And OK. So what they did is that they wanted to compute the value of PC or to estimate the value of PC. And they were looking for sufficient conditions to actually guarantee that you are subcritical. And the first condition that they looked at is that, well, if you are on a graph of a degree D or 2D, say, well, then PC has to be larger or equal to, to 1 over 2D. How do, do, did they do that? They just said, OK, if 2D times PC is smaller than, uh, times P is smaller than 1, then you have a very simple counting argument that tells you that you have at most 2D to the n walks of length n. They all have 
probability, I mean, uh, path of length n, every path has probability p to the n of being open. So the union bound is going to tell you that probability to be connected to distance n smaller than the sum of the whole path probability that this path is open. So smaller than 2d p to the n. So that's a simple argument to prove that pc has to be larger than 1 over 2d. But then you can try to improve this argument. For instance, you could say, OK, and that's what they did basically in this in this uh, paper, take a box of size. OK, that is not a centered box, but OK. Takes a box size of size 3 and look at the expected, I mean, the expected number of points on the boundary connected to the origin in the box. So this is something which is a little bit more complicated to compute. But notice that for a box of size 3 times 3, you can actually really compute this thing. At least expand and then try to see when this expected number is smaller than 1 strictly. So when this expected, let's call it phi p of the box of size 3. And what they prove is that if this phi p of the box of size 3 is smaller than 1 strictly, then in fact, you are also subcritical. I will explain to you the argument in a second in a more general framework. But I will explain this argument. And you see, you can definitely believe that the set of p for which this phi p of lambda 3 is smaller than 1, this set is going to be bigger than the set of p for which this is smaller than 1. So they get a better lower bound, basically. So that was the original idea, and that's one of the first papers on percolation theory, really one of the very first ones. And there the goal was to compute, to estimate PC. Well, funnily enough, this idea is uh, really at the core, like that's the center of the proof I'm going to present to you, which gives a very simple proof of this re result. I mean, very simple. Well, simple. OK, so we are going to try to extend a little bit the idea of uh, Hammersley and Welsh in a lemma. And it's going to be the, the following, uh, maybe a definition before. So the lemma will be here. I want to say that if there exists a set S finite and containing 0, such that phi p of s is smaller than 1, and I will tell you what phi p of s is in a second, then there exists a constant Cp such that theta n of p is smaller or equal to exponential of minus Cp times n. So what I claim is that if a certain quantity depending on a set of size s is smaller than 1, then I have exponential decay. And in particular, I'm smaller than Pc. And this phi p of s is the following. It's the sum of every x in s, y not in S, an X neighbor of Y, of the probability that 0 is connected to X in S, I'm going to denote it like that, times a parameter P. So what does this mean? It just means it's basically the expected number. So you have a set S. It contains 0. And it's the expected number of points on the boundary connected to 0 in S, except that there is two small things there. So there is a factor, there is a P in front. You are going to see it becomes very naturally. It comes, so there is P times this expected number. And there is a funny thing here, which maybe is bothering some of you, is that there is a y here. And this y is not there. That just means I want to count with multiplicity. Because a point x here may have several neighbors. You, you agree that because I'm summing on y neighboring x, and I'm saying that y is not in s, here, the only x that are important are the x on the boundary. If you are not on the boundary, you don't have any neighbor outside. So this here, you will not contribute. 
So you are only contributing when you are on the boundary, and you are contributing just with the multiplicity of the number of neighbors outside. Just it's going to be more convenient for what we want to do later. But otherwise, you can kind of forget that. It's not the main. It's just that it's going to be cuter later. But. So it's this expected number. Notice that this is what? This is just phi p of the singleton 0. Right? So what I claim in this lemma is that if I can find whatever s for which phi p of s is smaller than 1 strictly, then I have exponential decay. OK? He's trying to tell me something. Ah, hammer slash 57. OK. So it was not Welsh. It was 57, apparently. Thank you. Um, OK. So how do we prove that? So now I need to kind of prove to you this view. Um, maybe let's start again. So the idea is kind of intuitive. Is you want to compare a little bit to a branching process. You want to say, OK, you have a certain number of child, children. In this case, I hope you have more than one in this case. Um, so they are, the children are the points that are connected to 0 in S. And the goal is to say that basically, if the expected number of children is smaller than 1, then you die out with large probability. In fact, the probability that you survive for times n is going to be exponentially small. So it's a little bit the idea. Another way of seeing it is that you are kind of convoluting with something of average smaller than 1. But the idea is, uh, is going to be that. So fix k, fix s, putting 0, uh, such that, say, S is included in lambda k minus 1. So I just fix a k like that. It's finite, so I can find such a k. And let's look at theta n, I mean, k times n of p. And my goal, I'm kind of uh, making uh, like a spoiler alert on this one. If you don't want to know the end of the proof, do not watch what I'm going to write. I'm going to prove that it's more than phi p of s times theta k minus 1 of n. OK, my goal is to prove this inequality. If I can prove that, then it's automatic that I get this just by iterating. And I have my exponential decay since this is smaller than 1. OK? So my goal is to prove this inequality. And I'm going to do it as follows. So the idea is you have your set S containing 0. You have a box of size k around. And you want to connect to the box of size n times k, right? Observe that any path going from 0 to distance n times k <laughs> has to exit the set S somewhere. But more than that, what you can prove is that basically, if I condition on the cluster of the origin in my set, in my set S, so let's imagine you look at all the points that are connected to the origin in the set then there must be one point on the boundary of this cluster, which is, on which is on the boundary of the set, which is connected to 0 in this set, and which is connected to the boundary not using any point in the set S, in the connected component. So let me now translate this into something more uh, understandable. So let's call C to be the set of X in S, so that X is connected to 0 in S. So it's just a connected component of 0 in S. Yes? Uh, N. Uh, because here it was N minus 1. Thank you. So you look at the cluster here. OK? So that's the cluster inside. And what I claim is that 
if 0 is connected to the boundary of the box of size n times k, there exists a y in, uh, in S such that the following uh, is true. 0 is connected to y in, uh, no, sorry, the next, let's put it. 0 is connected to x in S, in, uh, in C, sorry. X is connected to a certain y not in S, or if you want, omega xy is 1. And y is connected to the boundary of the box of size n times k, but in C complement, so not using any C. So what I claim is really there is a point x here. It's neighboring a point y. y is connected to the boundary without using any points in C. And 0 is connected to x in C. OK? So I let you think about why this is true, why there is necessarily such a point, I mean, such an edge. OK? That's a good exercise to try to convince yourself of that. But once you have this, you can prove this inequality fairly easily. I mean, you can prove the other inequality fairly easily. How do you do that? OK, so let's take our n times k of p and just say, well, it's smaller than the sum. So this is smaller than the sum of the possible values of c, possible values of c, so of the probability that 0 is connected, or let's Let's even say sum over x and y. So x in s, y not in s, x neighbor of y, of 0 connected to x in c, omega xy equal 1, and y connected to the boundary of the box in c complement. Right? I just translated. I did the union bound on x and y. So here, either you are already kind of well acquainted with percolation and you can compute, uh, you can uh, conclude by the BK inequality. If you never saw the BK inequality, which you can do by hand. So let's try to do it by hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to condition on the possible values of C. So I'm going to add so there is x in S, y not in S, x neighboring y. And I'm going to sum over every C containing the origin and include it in, uh, include it in S. And I'm going to put exactly the same, but I am going to add c equals c. OK, let me maybe restate it. So it's going to be 0 connected to x, omega xy equal 1, y connected to boundary, and c equals c. And notice that now these conditions, they are deterministic because c is equal to c. So that, that doesn't make any sense when you say it, but on the board it kind of does. So C and C complement. OK? OK, and now notice that we are in a certain, I mean, in a good shape because what are the edges? I mean, this depends on which edges. That's the simplest one. So if you want to answer a question, it's now. <laughs> this depends on the edge xy, right? Only on the edge xy. What does this depend on, this one? So y connected to the boundary, not using any vertices in C. Well, it depends on all edges, so edges with both endpoints outside C. OK? And remains my last guys, this and that. So what do I need to know? to have c equals c and 0 connected to x in c. So 0 connected to x in c, notice that this is kind of trivial when, once you know what is c, right? Because this is just saying x belongs to c. Okay, So this is trivial. What does this depend on? Well, this depends on all the vertices, in, uh, I mean, uh, on a priori, on all edges with at least one endpoint in c. 
right? Why? Because you need to know that the points are connected to the origin, and you also need to know that no other point is in C. So you also need to know the boundaries somehow of your, uh, of your cluster. So it's really, it doesn't depend only on the edges with both endpoints in C, but at least one endpoint, that, that is sufficient. But the important thing is that these three sets are disjoint. Therefore, by independence, this is equal to the uh, product of the probabilities. So all of this, I have the same sum in front. I get probability that omega xy is equal to 1, probability that y is connected in C complement to the boundary, and then probability of 0 connected to x in C, and C equals C. OK? Now, this is just p. That's good because we want a p. The probability is that y is connected in the complement of C to the boundary of the box of size nk. That may look a little bit ugly. But notice that if y is at distance 1 of s, it is necessarily in the box of size k. So it's necessarily at distance k times n minus 1 at least of the boundary here. So this guy here, so this guy here is smaller. This is orange. This is smaller or equal to theta n minus 1 times k of p. Notice that I forgot the C complement because if you are asking that it's connected to distance and not using certain edges, it definitely reduces the probability of your event. So this one, we said it was p. So it's p times theta n minus 1 k of p. And then you get the sum over x in s, y not in s, x connected to y, of the probability times the sum over c of the probability that 0 is connected to x in c, and c is equal to c. Here you can bound if you want by s. Uh, actually, let's not bound it by s. So if you just, this whole sum here, what is it equal to? Well, it's just partitioning. When you partition on possible values of c, you are just partitioning the event that 0 is connected to x in s. So this is equal to that. So p times this quantity is exactly 5p of s. Here it is. So that's the end of the proof. OK? And basically, it is this proof was, so they didn't use 5p of s, but basically, that was the proof that they used in the, I mean, that Hammersley used in the original argument, basically. So it's a very classical proof. You can also find it for the Ising model, some similar uh, version of it. So it's, it's very classical and very simple. So that's not where things are smart. But now, what does this lemma tell us? Well, it tells us that, well, at PC, I mean, so, sorry. It tells me that if I define PC tilde to be the infimum of the P for which phi P of S is larger or equal to 1 for every S, always finite. Huh? It tells me that if I am below PC tilde, I have exponential decay automatically. That's what it tells me. But now what does it I mean, what more does it tell me? What is the simple corollary of that? Is that if I can prove that PC tilde is equal to PC, I am home. I finish my proof. Right? Because I would just have proved that below PC tilde, so below PC, I have exponential decay. So that is actually the piece of information that I'm going to use to try to get a better differential inequality that theta n prime larger than theta n times 1 minus theta n. So that is going to be our improvement. So the next lemma is going to be to prove that theta n prime is larger than, well, 1 minus theta n. But here, I'm going to put the, put the maximum 
uh, the minimum, sorry, over every set S included in lambda N of phi P of S. And actually, if I want to have something which is valid, I need to add this inequality. So what did I do here? I replaced, uh, replaced theta n by this quantity. Okay. So for every n, so why is it a much better inequality? Well, not, uh, notice first that this is the expected number of points connected to S for S in lambda n. So this quantity is always larger or equal to theta n. That's the first observation. So I'm not doing something more stupid than before. I'm not getting something smaller than theta n. So this thing is a priori larger or equal to theta n, right? Phi p over you. So this quantity is always larger than theta n. Therefore, this whole thing is better a priori than uh, our Poincaré inequality. But it's maybe not much better. That is possible. But notice that when p is larger or equal to pc tilde, what do I have? Notice this is the intersection on the set of p, so intersection on s of the set of p for which phi p of s is larger or equal to 1. So it's a closed set, this thing. Right? So because it's a closed set at p c tilde, phi p c tilde of s is larger or equal to 1 for every s. So that tells me that for p larger or equal to p c tilde, this quantity is larger or equal to 1. So in this context, I get this inequality. And that, that is a priori much better than theta n times 1 minus theta n. Because if you imagine that you have a whole range where you would not have exponential decay, theta n would go to 0. But here I'm telling you, well, no, 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 no. It's, you can improve your inequality to get constant and not theta n. So this is a much better inequality. So once you have that, for instance, you can easily just integrate this between pc tilde, so now a peak, so if, let's say if you take p strictly larger than pc tilde, then this whole thing here can be made, like it implies that theta n of p is larger or equal, so I'm always a little bit confused, but basically constant times p minus pc tilde. You can just integrate this between pc tilde and p, and you get something like that. The truth is uh, here you get maybe uh, 1 minus p and you get, uh, I mean, well, whatever. The important thing is you get constant times p minus p c tilde. For every n, this constant doesn't depend on n when you integrate this. But if it doesn't depend on n, just let n go to infinity. So when n goes to infinity, then the probability that 0 is connected to infinity is larger or equal to c times p minus p c tilde. And the only thing I'm going to remember is that it's just strictly positive. Therefore, for any p larger than p c tilde, p is smaller than p c, uh, is larger than p c. OK, so p larger than p c tilde implies p larger than p c tilde implies p larger than p c. And that implies that p c, so for every p, so that implies that PC tilde is equal to PC since obviously PC tilde was smaller or equal to PC. Okay, so that is the conclusion of the proof. The only thing I need to convince you of in the last minutes is how you get this differential inequality. Okay, but I hope you got at least an idea of why it's a better differential inequality. And just if you integrate it, you get what you want. Okay, so now proof of the lemma. Okay. So we are going to reuse our Margulis-Rousseau differential inequality. 
So remember, it was saying that the expectation of the derivative of the expectation was the sum of the covariances, basically. So apply it, but apply it not to indicator function that, or, or, let's say, apply Margulis Rousseau to minus indicator function that zero is, connect, is not connected to distance n. Why? Because the derivative of the average of that is the same as the derivative of zero connected to uh, distance n. So apply to this, what do you get? You get that theta n prime is equal to 1 over p, 1 minus p, times the sum over every edge in my box of size n of the probability, I mean of the covariance, between the indicator function that 0 is not connected to distance n times p minus omega e. Here, I, the minus, I just put it here. Instead of putting omega e minus p, I put p minus omega e. Okay, and now let's try to do exactly like yesterday for the crossing event. Let's try to see what is necessary, what do I need to see in my configuration for omega e to be correlated with the non-existence of a path. So let's take our box. We have zero, which is here. We have an edge here. What do I need to see? Well. First, if there is a path which is going to the boundary and is not using the edge E, then conditionally on all the edges but the edge E, you already know what is happening. So this edge is conditionally independent of the other one, and you will get 0 here. So the first thing that you know is that if there is an edge, I mean, if there is a path, I mean, all the paths have to be, sorry, have to be connected, have to be going through E. So in particular, you need to have a blocking surface going through E and surrounding the origin. On the other hand, if there is a blocking surface which is not using E, same thing. You won't be like changing the state of your edge E, won't change anything to the result. It will be conditionally in independent of the rest. So you need to have a path going like that. Okay? So that is necessary not to get zero. So here you can add. I, I noticed that you kept the uh, line. It's good. But, uh, and maybe nobody else did uh, talk on blackboard. But, okay. So here you can add indicator function that zero is connected to x, y is connected to the boundary, and x is not connected to y uh, in lambda n, or let's say 0 is not connected to the boundary in lambda n minus the edge. Right? I can add this. x and y, here I just index them to say that x is the guy connected to 0, and y is the endpoint connected to the boundary. OK, I can do it uh, uh, without any. Uh, OK, notice that here, this one, once I have all this information, what does this indicator mean? Just means that the edge E is closed. That's all, right? If it's open, I am connected. So that's not good. So here, I can replace this one by omega E equals 0. But in this case, the P minus omega E gives me just P. So here, I'm going to get a P. So let's make it in another color, maybe. I get a P here, and I can just remove that. So now I have expectation of omega E equals 0 and, and this event. OK, I'm almost done. So I have a 1 over P, 1 minus P. I have a P. This is going to be the guy that appears in phi P of S. So that's perfect. I don't touch it. And now I have the sum over every x, I mean, every edge of this thing. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just condition exactly as before. I'm going to condition on this time not the cluster of 0 in S, but the cluster of the boundary. Here I'm gonna condition. So let's sum over every, let's call it uh, C again, every C in lambda n. And I'm going to ask that 0 is not in C, because uh, that 0 is in C, sorry. And uh, okay, so C is a set of x which are not connected to the boundary of lambda n, x in lambda n. And I'm just going to condition, so I'm going to pro probability, so omega e equals 0, 0 connected to x, y connected to the boundary. 0 not connected to the boundary in lambda n minus e, which, by the way, if omega e is equal to 0, I can just ask this and remove this. This is the same. And I ask that c is equal to c. So I, again, and I have still a sum of these edges. Okay, so I just partition my set on the possible values of the points that are not connected to. So if you want, here would be kind of all these points. Okay. So now, let's try to understand how this translates when you know that c is equal to c. So clearly, x, I mean, 0 not connected to the boundary is exactly meaning, or maybe I should not put the c here. Let's put it like that. So 0 not connected to the boundary exactly means adding 0 in s. That means 0 is in s. OK? Then 0 connected to x, well, if 0 is not connected to the boundary and x is connected to 0, then it's not connected to the boundary. Uh, sorry, y connected to the boundary means y not in s. So y not in s. Uh, not in c, sorry. Then 0 connected to x, it forces x to be in s. So x uh, in C, still, I should not have changed the notation, just uh, I'm used to C, sorry about that. So x must be in S, in C. And here, 0 connected to x, it just becomes zero connected to x in C. I can add this condition because every point that I'm using to go from 0 to x has to be in C. OK, and I have C equals C. OK. How do we conclude? Well, we use exactly as before. This depends only on edges with both endpoints in C. And this, if you think about it, the set of points that are not connected to the boundary well, it's the complement of the set of points which are connected to the boundary. And this depends only, so this depends only on points with at least one endpoint outside C. So at least one endpoint outside C. So these two events are independent. And we get a 1 over P, 1 minus P. You get a P. And here you have a sum over x in C, y not in C. By the way, here I should also have said that x is neighboring y, which is, uh, here I should have kept it, maybe, omega x, y equals zero. So x is neighboring y. So here I get the sum over x in C, y not in C, x neighboring y of the probability that 0 is connected to x in C, times the p, it gives me exactly phi p of C. So I have the sum of a C of phi P of C times the probability that C is equal to C. Right? 
Now here, phi p of c is always larger or equal to the minimum of the phi p of s over every s. So this is larger or equal to 1 over p, 1 minus p, the minimum of the phi p of s for 0 connected to s and included in lambda n, because here, of course, c was included in lambda n as well. And I get the sum of the probability that c is equal to c when I sum over every possible c containing 0. So the last step of the proof is, what is this thing equal to? This, the event that c is equal to c over like the, party, the, the union of these events over every c containing the origin. This is just partitioning the event that 0 is not connected to the boundary. So this whole thing here, I can replace it by 1 minus theta n of p. And I get what I want. So it may look like not such a simple proof, but I mean, try to compare it <laughs> to what was existing before. So here, I really didn't put anything under the carpet. It's really the full proof. And in particular, for instance, it gives you a proof of uh, PC equal one half, like replaces the argument that I highlighted before, I mean, yesterday, using the BKKKL result, which is like it's not a straightforward result to prove. Trust me. So here, it's really completely, uh, I mean, it's a full proof. <coughs> You need to do it yourself somehow, this computation. But at the end, it's five lines, something like that. So it's not very, very long uh, proof. So that is a proof by hand. You may prefer it to a more elaborated proof. You may prefer it less. I mean, that depends on the taste. Uh, I, I think, I mean, you will see the next, like the proof that Vincent will present has its advantages. And in some aspect, is not more complicated than this one. It's a little bit more elaborate, but it's not longer. But I think, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I like this book. It's, uh, it's, uh, I was happy, I mean, we were happy when we, when we found it. Anyway, um, how, I mean, I, just in the 10 last minute, I was told that if you want to eat here, you have to fight with like uh, <laughs> 1,000 other people. So uh, we are going to try to have a head uh, start. So I'm going to finish uh, in 10 minutes, say something like that. Um, hoping that not everybody else got the same idea, right? <laughs> so we are all going to get out at the same time. Um, let me just highlight something here, which is, I mean, we use it twice. It's this part. Here, we use something which is really, really depending on the independence in our Bernoulli percolation model. And the historical proof of Menshikov and Eisenman Basky, Vincent will tell you a little bit more about the Menshikov proof, or at least on the differential inequality that you use for them. Um, they were also based on similar type of arguments using really independence. But it's a very, very delicate independence. I just want to highlight the following is that for more than 30 years, basically, well, well, less than 30 years, well, exactly 30 years. For exactly 30 years, even the following model was not understood. Try to break this property of being exactly independent for the edges and take a model which is like edges that are distance two will be independent, but not nearest neighbors. So take the following model. Imagine you are on Z2 even. Well, on Z2 it was known, but like on ZD, say. So you take your lattice. And what you do is that for every point in your uh, lattice, you take, you, you fill a ball, you put a ball of size 2, uh, maybe like size 2, let's, uh, let's put three, a ball of size 2 around the box with probability 1 minus p. So independently for every uh, point, you put the ball of size 2 around uh, the point with probability 1 minus p. And then you just take the complement of the union of all the balls. So if you want your open edges are edges which are not in any of these balls. 
Okay? So two edges, which are a distance four or five of each other, are completely independent because they only depend whether they are here or not, depend on the fact that one of the balls, uh, one of the points at distance two of it became open. Right? So it's a two, uh, it's a four dependent percolation model. Looks like it should work exactly the same, right? I mean, how can it be that it's so delicate that for exactly independence you can do the trick? And if you start to have like almost independence, right? There are distance, it's better than any type of correlation you can hope for. The correlations are zero when you are a distance four. Well, this thing proving, so there is a PC for this guy. There is a value of P where you start not to have uh, I mean, infinite clusters. It was not known that below PC, you would have sharpness of the, you would have exponential decay. So here, the proof by hand is very, very delicate. It depends very much on the thing. And for people who know Voronoi percolation, maybe uh, you heard about that, it's another type of percolation model where you color the Voronoi cell of a Poisson point process. There as well, you could really think, okay, this is the biggest independence you can hope for. Like it's a, once you have your cells which are very small and nicely packed, it's really side percolation on the cells. So how could it be complicated? Well, even for this model, none of the proof were working in higher dimension. So, okay, we have a proof that I can present to you in, in one hour. But somehow, it's kind of a miracle almost. In the sense that these are difficult. And I mean, these are very thin. You are walking on a thin rope. And if you just walk on one side, you fall. Okay? So the goal of the three next lectures will be that Vincent is going to tell you that he can catch you up. And you won't really fall. Because in fact, now we have an understanding that goes beyond this independent uh, percolation model. I should say there was one other model, which is the easing model, for which people knew that. But because there is a representation of the easing model that shares exactly this type of properties. So there was some miracle as well there. OK, well, we have even uh, almost 20 minutes. Uh, let's start. Thank you very much. Yes. 